Okay. Ready? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. I really appreciate you coming out on this cold night. My name is Eric Botcher. I'm the city council member representing the village, Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen. And I'm really excited about tonight. It's something that this is a meeting I've been wanting to have for a long time with all of you in the community to discuss a program that is an exciting program. It's an out of the box approach to what is one of the biggest humanitarian crises in New York right now. And I'm talking about the street homelessness epidemic. And quite frankly, the fact that in the richest city, in the richest country in the world, the fact that we have so many people sleeping on the streets every night is uh, shameful, shameful. And we as a city have really failed to address this issue. And it's, and it's a result of so many failures in, in, in housing policy, in our education system, in substance use, in mental health, in systemic racism. There's so many things that have come together to cause a situation where we have thousands of people sleeping on the streets every night in our communities. And the city has thrown uh, billions of dollars at this issue and it persists because we haven't addressed at the end of the day, it's the underlying problem is the lack of housing in New York, the lack of housing options in New York. But we have to address the issue of, of outreach and reaching people on the street and of providing them the, uh, with the opportunities for housing, with the opportunities for treatment and, and so many different tools. I get asked all the time from residents, what can I do as a resident to be part of the solution? And you know, telling people just to call 311 and summon DHS outreach workers, that's not enough for a lot of neighbors. They're like, you know, how can I be part of this? Well, the street advocacy, the street homeless advocacy, the street homeless advocacy project is uh, an, a great opportunity. And you know, this is one of these. I have these like pinch me moments all the time as a council member, and this is one of those. Introducing Norman Siegel. If you told me. Uh, a few years back, I'd be doing this. I, I wouldn't believe you. Um, you know, so many of you know who Mr. Siegel is. He um, went to the mayor after the mayor got elected and said, uh, we want to do this program that provides residents the opportunity to uh, volunteer and assist with the direct homeless outreach. And I imagine there was a lot more to that conversation, but the mayor ultimately said yes. <laughs> and they, they've been out there doing it. And it's been a success. But they need more people to participate, which is why I was so excited to send this out, invite the community to be part of it. I'd like to do more of these information sessions and give folks the opportunity to learn more about what this program is, how to be part of it. I want you all though to know that my team and I, every day, all day, this is one of the main issues that 
we're working on with all the different agencies to try to address this crisis. And I'm so excited to have this tool and to have all of your partnership. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Norman Siegel. Let me thank all of you for coming. We're also a very cold night, and especially thank the city council person, Eric, for doing this. Uh, my hope is that this is a success this evening. How do I measure success? I don't know. Uh, but if people walk out and feel okay about tonight, we've got some information, and we get some people to actually volunteer. Uh, on the table in the back, I had the volunteer information form. If you fill it out, uh, that's a success. Uh, we start with the premise that no one, no one should have to live on the streets of New York. And with that premise, we have discovered after 15 months of doing this under the Street Homeless Advocacy Project, SHAP, uh, although I've been doing this on my own individually for years, uh, that I would estimate that about three quarters of the people out on the street, they agree with that premise. They don't want to be out on the streets. But because of their situations, uh, very often traumatized for A to Z reasons, we can talk to that, and hopefully there'll be a question and comment period. Uh, because the best part of these events that I've done is the questions and comments that come up. And uh, I'm an ardent believer in free speech, so even if you get up and you say, see, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> because then I have an opportunity to say, you're wrong. <laughs> you have a First Amendment right to be wrong. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate that in the next minute or two. Uh, I give the example sometimes of uh, colleges, and don't get me going on colleges today about how the uh, universities are so timid, they're so scared of their donors, they're scared of their students, they don't know what to do with the demonstrations. <laughs> but very often when the colleges ban someone from speaking because they're controversial, uh, I always think that's wrong. You're creating martyrs. And second, I have five grandkids, four of them are in college now, one's about to go. Any one of them, even three years ago, when they were in high school, could get up and take some of the controversial speakers on and show they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so why be afraid of speech? Uh, we need more of it. And, and similarly, that analogy, we need more people caring about the social justice issues, specifically economic rights, and because of the homeless population, over the last four decades. Uh, my first homeless case was in 1982 with a woman on the Third Street Women's Shelter, and I was the head of a group called Mobilization for Youth. Uh, it's no longer called Mobilization for Youth. It's Mobilization for Justice. And second, I'm no longer youth either. And so <laughs> in the context of that, uh, the idea of doing this came out of an example when in 1966, when I was a law student at NYU, I went south and part of a program called the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council. And 70 of us from all over the country, we met in a place called Edwards, Mississippi. We were trained to be law students for the civil rights lawyers that were in the south. And that whole period, I went back in 67, and went full time for the ACLU in its southern office, 68 and 72. It really made a difference, at least in that part of the country, with regard to the issue of race. And it came about because people were working, registering people to vote, uh, taking on some of the segregationists, and it made a change. And I kept thinking over the years that when I was representing homeless people, that if we had a similar kind of program uh, up south, in places like New York and Washington, Boston, Philly, and even if they did it out in uh, the West Coast, if we had people now <coughs> focusing in on economic rights, but then we found out that even on the economic rights, it's disproportionately a racial issue as well. 
most of the people out on the streets. There's four to 5,000 homeless people uh, tonight in this very cold weather. Uh, they've been to the shelters, uh, and they've rejected it for good reasons. When you listen to them, they got beaten up in the shelters. They got sexually abused, not just women, but men as well. Uh, their belongings were stolen, or someone before told me about someone. Uh, I don't think they heard Call the That's, the That's me. That's right. Okay. Uh, Call the and told me about a friend of his in the shelter where they threw all her belongings out. And why? And he said, because they considered it clutter. Well, I told him, tell her to call me. We'll try to do something about that. They can't do that. Uh, but in the shelters, in the same case I had in 1982, it was about the conditions in the shelter and also the staff uh, and how they abuse people, how they stereotype the people. Uh, they're not interested in finding out the complexities of who that person is, what happened, why they wound up being homeless, and whether they still have any dreams. Do they want to get back on their feet? Do they want a job? Do they want to go back to their family? These are all human things. And to some extent, we can uh, create an environment, in my opinion, of all kinds of New Yorkers. Uh, one of the reasons I love a jury rather than a judge is because that whole human element comes out. And you see sometimes the best in people in the juries. Uh, sometimes you see judges, since he's recording it, some of the judges are very good, especially the ones I have to appear tomorrow or next week. Uh, but the idea that there's so many talented people in this city, if we had enough time and we went around this room, if it was a smaller group, I would do that. But this will take us at least Knowing New Yorkers, if I say, give me 15 seconds, they'll go for four or five minutes before I have to cut them off. Uh, but you would find such talent here. You would find people who are interested in social justice and in the human element. And finally, to validate ourselves. I can tell you when I do homeless outreach on Thursday nights, to seven to nine, and I'll get to that in a little while, uh, all the cases that I'm involved in, some of them which I win, and feel really euphoric about. When I go home, and if I got one person that night off the street, not into a congregate shelter, but into a hotel room, or to a safe haven, a stabilization bed, or refer them to a drug program, or a mental health program, I'll talk about that, because that's a serious issue out on the streets as well, or even get them into a job placement program. I don't need to take one of the two homes, I live on 72nd, I can fly home because I'm feeling so good because it's real. I touch somebody. Sometimes in the court, you win a case, it's all abstract. It's hypothetical. And even if I got a piece of paper that said we won, the people in government don't enforce it and we got to go back again and again. But if you take someone and put them on the van and they're going somewhere where they can begin to put their life together, uh, that's real. It's really good. So we started in August of 2022. We've done it now for 15 months. There's three or four SHAP volunteers that are here. And when we're going to open up for questions and answers, I want them to come up here with me. Because part of our thing is not about me. It's about the team effort. The people that we have, and I've worked with a lot of different groups and different people. What's great about the volunteers in SHAP, not only do they care about social justice, but they're not ego-driven. They're not doing it in order to get in the New York Times or on Channel 4 or 2. And they're not doing it for money either. And that is important because when we do outreach out on the streets, one of the first things people ask us, do you work for the city? And we say no. That gets us a few points, positive. Mm -hmm. uh, the way it goes is the city has all their people dressed in orange. They have orange t-shirts, orange hats. Now Hoko got in on it, and she appropriated a whole bunch of money, and they now have purple clothes. Yeah. So very often the homeless people say to us, are you either the people or, orange, or the, the uh, purple people? And we say no. That gets us another few points. And they say, 
which is opening the door. Well, who are you and what are you doing this? And then we can explain to them, we're fellow New Yorkers. We care about you. We care about trying to see if you want some help, as opposed to saying to them, you want to go to a shelter. If they've been there, they hear that, they figure, you're not helpful to me. You don't understand the issue. And we chose Thursday nights, 7 to 9, because we wanted to get a lot of young people. And first, we're going to do it on Friday nights, because personally, I and the other four originators, one of them who's here, Mark Greenberg, uh, uh, Friday nights, there's no court. Uh, you don't have to be in court the next morning on Saturday or anything else. But the college students said, no, that's party night. You can't have it on Friday night. So that's the origin of Thursday nights. Seven to nine, only two hours, because you've got to be realistic. If you're asking people to volunteer, first you've got to make sure that people understand that we're serious. Oh, we're very serious about this. Second, we know what we're doing. We know what we're doing. Five originators, add our years of dealing on homeless issue, 162. Uh, so it was Bob Hayes who created the right to shelter in the Callahan decision. Uh, Mark Greenberg is over here, uh, over 25 years, uh, head of the Inner Faith Assembly for Homelessness and Housing. Uh, Harriet McDonald from the Doe Fund. Deborah Berkman from New York Legal Assistance Group, whose whole project is about street homeless people, and myself. So in the context of that, we came together on that premise, and we came together also to try to test out the approach so that if we're having the same team going to the same location at the same time every Thursday night, 7 to 9, we have a chance of getting some of the people to begin to know us, for us to know them, and get trust. The only way you can begin to get someone to voluntarily leave the street is if they begin to trust you. And sometimes it takes two or three interactions. Uh, sometimes when we're talking to someone, uh, I'm listening to them, I don't know what the heck they're saying. Because some of the people out there, even if they didn't have it when they hit the streets, after being there for a period of time, they have mental health issues. That doesn't mean they're a danger to themselves or others. I know a lot of lawyers that have mental health issues. Some elected officials who have <laughs> mental health issues. Excluding, of course, the one who's here. But in the context of that, that's cool. What do we do with that? And how do we deal with that is a world of difference. The idea that we're not driven by numbers, so that we're out there in order to justify to our funders that we have numbers. And as at Civil Liberties, we very often, even the foundations, that they would fund us. On the annual report for renewal, I had to give them numbers of what we did. But when you're dealing with this population, it can't be numbers. For example, we measure what's called an interaction. If I'm talking to you and you're homeless and you don't want to talk to me, we step back. If we spend three or four minutes, but I don't get to know even your name, because you won't give it to me in those three or four minutes, understandable. Uh, we're not counting that as an interaction. We generally tell people you need the person's name, and you have to know something about them for it to be an interaction, an engagement. Because if you're talking a minute or two with someone and they blow you off, that's not very valuable. So you don't have to be <coughs> pressured in the way you're talking to someone to get the numbers that night. And again, I <coughs> think that by doing it on a volunteer basis, when they find out we're not getting paid and they begin to want to know more about us, and then we start talking to them, all I'm looking for is even if I'm not following where his train of thought is, if I can find one little piece that I could pull on to continue the conversation, we begin to develop 
a relationship. And what we also found out, since most people who are out on the street, we read Ralph Ellison's book, The Invisible Man, that's what homeless people are. Most people walk by them. They don't even acknowledge them, uh, even if they're asking for money. Uh, you don't have to give them money. Uh, you just could say, good afternoon, and begin a smile comes at someone. Because most people just walk by. They're invisible. Uh, also, the other thing, when we talk about people money, I've been doing it for 15 months at the Staten Island Ferry on the Manhattan side. So there's a lot of homeless people. Only once time in the 15 weeks did someone ask me for money. And he needed the money to get a hamburger from Wendy's. Even if I had the money or I wanted to give them, I would have told them not to go to Wendy's. Uh, but you get something more nutritional. But uh, also people wonder, is it a safety factor? We've never had any incident where a homeless person has touched anyone or even uh, came close to touching anyone. We had one instance where someone made some verbal threats. And then in analyzing what happened, it was that the two volunteers, relatively new, and it was almost 9 o'clock, and so I think they wanted to go home. And so they approached some guy. There were two white volunteers approaching a young black man who was sort of angry to begin with. And they said to him, do you want a place tonight to stay? Uh, it's totally the wrong approach. Uh, because there was no opportunity to begin to have that kind of interaction and dialogue. And if you've got to go back a second time, I have a guy down there. We call him X. Eight times, Carolyn and I, who goes to Staten Island Ferry with me, there's this one guy, uh, we'll call him C at this point, and we keep talking to him. We've become friends with him, but we can't get him off the street. <clears throat> I don't even know the full story because he keeps telling us his sister is going to come and give him some stuff where he's going to be staying with his brother somewhere. Uh, I don't believe it. But I'm not there to make judgments about the people, because if I start making judgments, the trust won't come about. So for our first year, we did 535 interactions. Uh, 198 of those interactions led to people voluntarily leaving the streets. Now, where we failed, <laughs> probably a lot because of the city and Department of Homeless Services, when we twice asked them for a dozen people on two different occasions to tell us, where are they now in your system? Both times, more than just the majority, came back, the city didn't know where they were. So part of the frustration is that we're working in the way that I just described in a system that's a total mess. It's not coordinated. Sunday, one of our volunteers goes out in Brooklyn, in the Red Hook neighborhood. She sees these two guys on the street. She's got a little time. She starts talking to them. They're interested, she calls me, in voluntarily getting off the street. So she calls the Department of Homeless Services. It's a 24-7 uh, operation. and. She gives them their name, we have to give them their date of birth, they check in the computer, and they're told, she's told, uh, they don't have any placements for these two guys. They want to go together, makes sense, they're buddies, they don't want to be separated. Nowhere. I don't believe it. Can't be, even though it's a holiday weekend, there's got to be people there, there's got to be placements in the city. So I call, around noon, it rings, rings, rings. I watch my clock, three minutes, so I have a good affidavit to say that I didn't hang up immediately, the lawyer in me. Uh, and then they say on the computer, uh, the voice, that if no one picks up, press star and we'll call you back. So I waited 30 minutes, did other stuff in my house, no call back. So what I did, I filed a complaint. And they're now looking into it to find out why no one was picking up the phone. Why did they didn't call back? And that's just an anecdote of the frustration, if you're going to be involved with us, of what this is about. But the key word in our street homeless advocacy project, what do you think the key word is? 
Advocacy. You got it. Advocacy. So we're advocates for the people out on the streets, advocate for them to tell them what their rights are, to tell them what options they have, to be the advocate to create the options for them. But then also, what we've learned makes us credible advocates to the system. Those conversations I had with the mayor, and he's a good friend of mine for 35 years, I've represented him. Some of them it's a good thing. It's not recorded, though who knows who is recording it. But they're, they're strong. I mean, why get rid of the encampments when you know that the people are there? There's a golden opportunity to go and work the encampment, to get them to voluntarily come up. You, you get rid of the encampment, they're only going to create other encampments in other places. And that's exactly what happens. But also, if you're trying to, your goal is to get people off the streets and to get them to go to places other than the congregate shelters or change the congregate shelter system, the model itself, it doesn't work. I agree with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and hopefully, we can begin through this project on that part of the advocacy. So even if you don't want to go out and do outreach, the idea that you would want to be an advocate to write stuff, memos, analysis, research, op-ed pieces about this crisis and how to reform it, we can make a difference. There's no doubt about it. Uh, as I said before, with Eric being a leader within the council, if we can get people from tonight who are willing to be trained in a more uh, uh, conducive uh, setting for training where we do role playing, we have in depth do's and don'ts about what to do. We don't want anyone going out there that's not prepared to deal with some of this stuff. It's not fair to you, it's not fair to people out on the street. So, in the context of that, if this can work here, why can't every city council person, all 51 of them, in all the neighborhoods, get people from the neighborhood? to go out in their neighborhood to talk to people over a period of time and to then see our rate the first year was roughly one out of three. The second year, since we learned so much more, we know better how to approach people and who not to approach because there are certain people that you don't approach. We're now one out of two. And Eric was right also when he made a reference. The last year's budget was three and a half billion dollars of our taxpayers' money going into this system that's a total mess. And not just Eric Adams' fault, though he's now made himself part of this legacy of bad leadership, all the way from the people that I've had to deal with, Ed Koch, even David Dinkins. Definitely Rudy Giuliani, classmate of mine at NYU. He was creepier in law school than he is even today. So in the context of that, though today he's really hit bottom. Some of the moments I even feel sorry for him, uh, which is quite a statement in and of itself. Uh, and uh, Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg used to have churches and synagogues having up to a dozen people in their basements. Mm -hmm. Bloomberg didn't like it. He, got, he really eliminated uh, so much of those programs. Uh, we're trying to recreate it now. Mark has been doing a great job in trying to recreate it, but there's a real problem because we need to get sprinkler systems in those places now, which they didn't focus in back then. It's a valid reason, but the sprinkler system, how much does it cost, Mark? How much does the sprinkler system cost? $60,000. 60, 60000 per one. Per site. So it's There's only two sites out of the 50 interested that have the sprinkler system. Mm -hmm. right, so there's 48 there. <laughs> uh, but there's other stuff uh, we put together as advocates uh, with some volunteer law firm uh, who wanted to be anonymous. Uh, so I can't say their name. Uh, we put together a document for the mayor and his key people the use of eminent domain. Eminent domain is a program uh, that the government, the municipality, the state can use 
in a public crisis situation. We got a public crisis situation. In the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of hotels that were vacant. And even some of the owners, to the lawyers that know, said they don't, they want to give up. They don't want them anymore. So we put together a really good report. The mayor gave us the green light. We presented it back in December of 2022, saying that the state should then use eminent domain and purchase some of these vacant hotels. And the state can transfer the ownership to the city. And the city can then decide to let it be run by the city, a profit or a not-for-profit. You could take two or three of these hotels as a pilot. One of the problems in my neighborhood when they put people up on 76th Street in a hotel is that in the daytime, there was no nothing for the people to do. So they I hung agree out. With you. Excuse me? I agree with you on that. Two for two, man. I'm doing good. <laughs> you you got to stay the whole night. You can't go. Is that still clear? <laughs> Excuse me? Is that the Bill Clare Hotel? Okay. Uh, it was yes, on sir. 79th Street off Columbus. I forgot the name of it. Yes, sir. The, okay. Street. Mark, what was the hotel on 79th Street called? Uh, 79th Street. Yeah, <laughs> but it had a name, the hotel? Yes, sir. Right. I, I can't remember. Okay, whatever it was. So the, the overwhelmingly mm -hmm. men, black men in that neighborhood, oh, yeah. created a stir in and of itself. And then especially when they were doing nothing but drinking, whether it was beer or something more, that created a problem. And then one, two of the guys masturbated or something allegedly. That got the whole neighborhood crazed. So part of our plan was that you take these hotels and create almost like a college atmosphere, where during the daytime, there are courses that people volunteer come in and teach. Teach the history of civil rights, teach the history of homelessness, show documentaries, keep them involved during the daytime so that they begin to see that there's some light at the end of the tunnel, and then have the social workers there who can work with the people and begin to figure out where they can go next. How do you get them moving along with the goal, as Eric rightfully said, of creating like an SRO unit or some permanent housing? But before people can get there, because I've had clients out who are homeless, and people would call and say, I got a, a single room for them. And my answer was, I'm not sure they're ready to do that. And here's why. Because you have to understand that some of these folks out there, they just can't cope. Or if they have a situation, sometimes we get a guy on the van and something triggers mm -hmm. something that happened in their past and they want off. Or we're about to put them on the van, and all of a sudden the idea of going somewhere that they've never been before. And I, I have that situation sometimes when I go somewhere before. Even coming here tonight, I was a little nervous. Is this going to work? How is it going to happen? And then it got filled. I saw the people's faces. It's going to work. Uh, so in the context of that, understanding that human dynamic uh, and being able to then uh, interact with people to try to move them along, get them off the street voluntarily, and then as you become more and more credible in talking about this issue, become an advocate to try to change the system in the city council hearings, or even if there isn't a city council hearing, pick up the phone, try to get a meeting with the local city council person. Ain't hard here, but what about the other 50 people? If we could do that, I think in three years, you could have half of the people off the streets. Problem then becomes, how do we get the city to then create more viable options for people? And here's where we'll end. The viable options, in my opinion, are not immediately housing for everyone. Because not everyone's ready for the housing right now. You've got people out there different from the 50s uh, and the Bowery where they were basically just men, usually disproportionately white, alcoholics. They were called derelicts, bums, bad terms. They're people. Today, it's much more complex. You go to Washington Square Park, and you see the complexity there. 
You see in one part, uh, we used to call it the pharmacy on the northwest part, because there's so much drug activity there. Back then, when I was in school, it was marijuana. Now it's much heavier stuff. But then throughout the park, there are homeless people as well. And on the side streets, there are homeless people. And in the context of that, the majority of the people that are out there are people of color, and disproportionately, they're like these two folks, dark-skinned, black. Even the Latinos, the white Latinos, don't have as much of the problem as the dark-skinned Latinos. It's a color problem. <coughs> and in the context of that, a lot of us in looking around the room, I'm a gringo, but I'm a proud to be a gringo. That's who I am, okay? Uh, and in the context, when I'm dealing with people, I've got to somehow let them know that I ain't what they think every white person is. Just as I have to make sure that when I'm looking at her or him, since there's more of him than her out there, but there's some of her too. I would estimate 10% are homeless women out on the street. And we have to deal with some of this stuff in recognizing what the realities are. Uh, we had some hard decisions where some of the guys would re be more receptive to talking to some of the women volunteers than some of the guys. Uh, well, that's sexism. Are we going to play that game? We decided we'll do it, but we want to make sure that there's just this kind of operation, nothing anymore. We've never had that problem. Um, we've got folks here from all over the community. This program is starting in some geographic areas. Could you talk a little bit about where, where this is starting and, and expanding? Because yes. I imagine a lot of folks, they want to work where they volunteer where they live. That's one on the form. If you want to put out, we ask what neighborhood you're from. So our, our teams have been Staten Island Ferry on the Manhattan side. Carolyn, uh, Joan, Joan has been there a couple of times, uh, and Carolyn's been there a whole bunch of times, and she lives in this neighborhood. Uh, and then we have Mark's team on 31st Street in front of the church, which is a different operation because at the church operation, it's uh, food, and people come there every night. So we're not out in the streets looking for homeless people. They're already there. Uh, one of the thoughts we had at Washington Square Park, if we could set up a kiosk in Washington Square Park with coffee and donuts on certain hours during the week so that people would be, the, it would be a magnet to attract people. But some of the people it. would come out three for three, keep going. So there would be more people coming in a natural way. Then we've had a team, uh, you want to have a question? I'm thinking about Jordan Neely, the Michael Jackson impersonator, yep. who, was, who ended his life ended tragically. He was put on a chokehold by a white guy. He was in contact with Bowery, the Bowery uh, BRC. BRE. On a regular basis, he would go there to eat his food. So, as, as you said, we should, we should start with already organized group like the BRC in the Bowery. Sometimes me myself, I go there when I, when I don't have money and I need food. And they serve good food from Whole Foods. And there's also a van for medical. So maybe we should, we should already coordinate with these people. And not far from here is the Savior Mission run by the Jesuits. They give food every Sunday. Uh, from 12.30 to 1.30 and there's a whole line to come to the 5th Avenue and uh, again this, these are already uh, very regular, they go there every, every Sunday for closing. So as you said that maybe we should already coordinate so that we can work faster and more effective. Thank you. Okay, well thank you and that's an option. Uh, we feel that some of those places, uh, one or two of the places that get funded from the city, there's some mixed reviews from the homeless people out on the street about even some of the programs, one of which you mentioned. Uh, and But that's an option that people have. On the other hand, we want to get out on the streets and get people to leave the streets as opposed just to get food or clothing. We want to, that's a first step in leading to something more permanent uh, 
And so, but for people who want to do that, I think that's a really good thing to do. Back to Eric's question. So we're, we've got a team up from 125th in Harlem. Uh, we had a team in the Bronx. Uh, we had a team back at Tompkins Square Park. And then after a while, we found out that whatever the homeless people there were, they weren't there anymore. <clears throat> and so we decided to move to another location there. Uh, we are starting this Thursday night up on the Upper East Side with Hunter College students, a program on the Upper East Side. Uh, we started a program at Brooklyn College, which I went to, uh, but it fizzled out. Uh, the students didn't really follow through. Uh, so I don't know what the status of that is. Uh, we try to do one in Staten Island at the Staten Island College because we were working with CUNY. Uh, the <laughs> Chancellor of CUNY, a pretty good guy, uh, said that in the next year he'll let us have access to five of the CUNY systems and if it works, we'll have access to the entire CUNY system. Uh, but to me, that's only just one segment, college students. What about other people, uh, people who are working? What about semi-retired people, retired people? Let's get to the whole diaspora out there. Uh, so we're now in four or five areas. We'd love to be able in a couple of years to be in two dozen areas. And tonight is an experiment where if we can get people to fill out the forms, and are interested, we'll set up a time and a place to do a formal training, and then we'll figure out within Eric's district, which now I've been told goes all the way to 59th Street, so we could hit uh, not only Penn Station, we could hit uh, the bus uh, authority on 42nd and see whether there's anything in the 50s uh, in that area. So we basically always want at least half a dozen people to be part of a team. Why? Because each Thursday night, we don't expect every person to be able, because of their life, to be out there every Thursday night. So you need at least two or three people with a team leader to be able to do it. So if one or two people can't make it, the team can still go on. So if we had six people, we have one team. If we had 12, we're going to have two teams and do the math for the rest of it. So. Now, I'd like Mark and Carolyn and Joan to come up here so on the questions and comments that come, uh, they can add also, and you can see some of the people who are doing what I just told you. So I hope you're interested, and I hope you'll sign up, and I hope you'll join us. One more question, attorney. What in the law, in New York State law, as a lawyer, would you think should we rescind in favor of homeless, the homeless? in your experience as a first-rate civil rights lawyer. Why don't we come back to that one, yeah. and that's after. Let's let's start with questions about the program. Um, raise of hands. Who has a question about yeah, Eric, this Eric, if I could program. just also, because yeah. I have to go to another event in a few minutes, but I'm glad that I'm able to step in here before I leave. I just wanted to clarify what we do on, on at our Midtown team. We have a number of members there, and as Norm said, Church of St. Francis of Assisi is a safe haven for many homeless people. Every morning at 7 a.m. they do what they call their uh, St. Francis bread line. They've been doing it since 1930. 1930. Wow. For 93 years. They missed three days because of Hurricane Sandy. So people, homeless people stay there, and it's a safe place for them to come. So we go at night. We set up a table. We're now serving some hot beverages, and we have a table for clothes. Um, because it's getting cold, and then sometimes we invite other groups to come and, and provide some dinner so that people come and we get to talk to them. And as Norman said, we create a community, a, a community where we get to know people and we can say, can we help you find a safe place? Would you like us to try to find a safe place for you? And many people have seen what the city's offering and they don't want it. They, they just leave me alone. I've already seen that. I've been harassed. I've been attacked. I've been threatened. So we will say, we will, in one case, one guy was concerned about going onto the, onto the van. I said, what's going on? He said, I, I don't trust it. I said, I'll follow the van, and I'll go to where they bring you, and if you don't like it, I'll bring you back. Bringing him back was sleeping on a piece of cardboard in front of the church. That's what bringing, because at least he knew where he was going to be in front of the church. He didn't know where, they could have taken him out to the middle of nowhere and then say, 
And if you don't like it, you know, walk someplace else. But what we try to do is create a sense of safety. And over time, we, we help people find a safe place. And as Norm said, the most important thing that we're doing is we are in ongoing communication with the city. And we're saying to them what we're finding. And we're saying you need to change things in some of the places where you're sending people. So that's really important. Uh, part of what we do. It's, it's, it's establishing relationships, and as we say, it's really as much for you as for anyone else. It's All of us have to learn to be able to be more comfortable with folks on the street so they can be more comfortable with us. So as the opportunities to change things happen, we can be part of that conversation. But I also want to just say a little uh, advertisement. If any of you would like to bring any clothes to join us Thursday in front of the church, because it's getting very cold. We have a table set up for clothes. Uh, you're welcome. And again, it's, it's West 31st between 6th and 7th, and we have a table, and uh, we just people are cold. We're actually right down the street from a, from a migrant hotel from 7, 7 to 9. We're there every Thursday except for Thanksgiving, and we welcome you, and Shanique was a great member of our team. And there's a lot of things we can do there. We serve, again, hot coffee, hot tea, uh, hot chocolate. Uh, now we're providing some oatmeal and some cup of soup. So we, we kind of a little bit expanded. Also, we have a group um, uh, from the Muslims, uh, Muslims Giving Back. They have this hunger truck. Every third Thursday they provide meals. We have a Hindu group that wants to be providing uh, meals once a month. We're, gonna, we're trying to work that out. So we try to create a place where everybody feels welcome. And it really is a very wonderful experience, and I welcome all of you, and thank you. And I just want to say, it's such a pleasure to work with this no, no, man. It is, it really is, <laughs> because he's been doing such great work for so many years, and to see him so involved in homelessness is really just as uh, so, it's so uh, moving to me. So thank you, Norman. Thank you. <laughs> so, I've, I've also got to go to, a, to an event at the center next door. But, um, so I'm going to leave it in uh, Mr. Siegel's no, no, capable no. hand. And also my, my staff, we have our whole amazing team here, Lori Harjo-Warogo, Hannah Moses, Carl Wilson, Paul Barr, Max Giuliani. And um, um, so please ask questions about really what the next steps are with how to get involved. Just give us a minute.